2017 was an absolutely killer year for 3D platformers. After what felt like an eon of silence from the genre, this long dormant style of video game is back in full force, baby, including a humble little crowd-funded title known as A Hat in Time. At first glance, A Hat in Time seems like a simple and yet devoted love letter to the fans of yesterday's platformers. Everything we remember seems present and accounted for. Collectibles, cartoonish enemies, huge worlds to explore. This game may be brand new, but its heart and soul is straight out of the past. It's been a long time since the heyday of these types of games. And being able to accurately reproduce what made them so fun and special might be tough for any developer to pull off. But regardless, I am beyond hyped to find out as I complete A Hat in Time. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. Last year in 2017, there was a game I was obsessed with wanting to complete, but I never got around to it because I was so freaking busy. So today, we're gonna complete A Hat in Time. Let's begin. Yes! Right. I've had my eye on A Hat in Time since it was first kickstarted way back in 2012. The creators originally conceived of the project when they realized that there weren't just many good 3D platformers being made anymore, and apparently they weren't the only ones that felt that way. Their initial Kickstarter goals were almost immediately blown out of the water by hundreds of rabid supporters, including myself. I gave them 100 bucks of my good old cash, but then my credit card bounced without me realizing it, and I'm not in the credits. I helped. But sometimes, all the money in the world can't stop delays from happening, and this game was hit by delays for a while. Like, a long while. It was supposed to be released in 2013, but apparently, all that extra time spent in the development oven helped to make A Hat in Time the incredibly charming game that it ended up becoming. With all the hard work of an international group of developers, a handful of great voice actors, and a whole bunch of different composers, what started as a little indie project turned into a much larger and more exciting game that I am personally stoked to dive into. Alright, so it's obvious, this is a 3D platformer, which means that completing this game means running around, collecting a slew of items, and accomplishing a bunch of random tasks. And I'm gonna love every minute of it, baby. Sure, there are achievements to unlock, and who knows what other potentially frustrating stuff this game will end up throwing my way. But who cares? I am ready to relive my childhood with this one! Even though I've never played it. And it's the, the first in the series. It's gonna somehow be a trip down memory lane, even though I've never technically been there. It's... Nostalgia. A Hat in Time really focuses on a cohesive presentation and a simplistic plot, all the while maintaining a sense of immense wonder and joy. A Hat in Time puts you in the boots and top hat of a little girl named Hat Kid, who is, for some reason or another, in a spaceship trying to get home. Whoever thought it was a good idea to let a little kid pilot a spacecraft is beyond me, let alone a spacecraft capable of traveling on time, but you gotta be incredibly smart if you're that kid. Suddenly, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, a dude from the Mafia slams into her ship, demanding a toll to pass by Mafia Town. While doing so, he breaks the window of her spaceship, causing a bunch of hourglasses, called timepieces, to fly out and onto the planet below where Mafia Town is located. Upon ascending down to Mafia Town, Hack Kid meets Mustache Girl, a fellow young girl who wants to battle the evil corruption of the Mafia themselves. Themselves. But the important takeaway here, kids, is that Hat Kid must get back all the timepieces so she can go home. Now, before we dive any further into this game, I just want to put it out there that I indeed do know the folks who worked tirelessly on this game for many years. Grant Kirkhope did a couple of tracks for the game. I know a few of the voice actors who are in the game, with John Tron playing the role of the receptionist owl and Young Town playing the Snatcher, which by the way, the Snatcher is my favorite freaking character. Holy God, Young Town, you crushed it. You blew it. You totally screwed yourself. 
Even one of the artists who worked on Hat in Time actually made some merchandise for me some time ago. Anyways, I just want to voice all of this right now, because while I really do like the overall look and feel of A Hat in Time, I do have a few qualms with it. So when I first saw the game, I really got the vibe that this was aiming for more of a game that has the Super Mario Sunshine aesthetics, with the world building and level designs of a game like Spyro. And man, those influences are definitely present here. But I feel like the graphics look a little bit different than I initially thought they were going to be. To me, it seemed like this game was going for more of a wind waker cell shaded look but in the end visually it kind of comes off a little bit more flat now it's in no way by means a bad look i really do love it but it's something i wasn't expecting oh man now i really know how it feels to talk to people about star wars the last jedi on twitter i think the gist is that it's not my game it's their game and what their game is at times feels a little dated but in other moments it shines so bright and at the very least the loading screen title cards make me want to print them out and put them up in my office. Oh my god, I love them! But I did feel that the frame rate was a bit inconsistent. Now this is always something that's unfortunate when playing a PC game, because low frame rates could not be the problem of the game itself, but more or less it could be a problem with my own PC. In my experience with the game, this would happen at least once or twice a mission, and mostly in the first world. After playing the console versions of the game, I did notice that it would dip as well. It's not really game breaking per se, but it's something I definitely noticed. A Hat in Time has four worlds to explore in, each one offering drastically different atmospheres. I'd argue that even though there's only four, the ones that are here are pretty freaking unique. All four worlds are packed tight with stuff to look at, hilarious interactions to play with, and a ton of totally goofy characters to mess around with and beat up. From the boardwalk empire of Mafia Town, to the spooky, scary world of Subcon Forest, to the Hollywood area, but with avian creatures that have a Battle of the Birds type situation, to the above the clouds alpine skyline, every level in a hat in time begs for you to climb around in it, exploring every nook and cranny that you can. Every character, every line written, every world is put together in a way that's just meant to be as joyous and as silly as possible. Running and leaping from point A to point B has that feeling of exploratory pleasure that the classic character platformers from yesteryears were filled to the brim with. And all of the character work is so good. I just wanted to keep talking to people. There's also a lot of useless things to do in a hat in time, and that's awesome. Sitting in chairs is something you can do all the time in the game and for some weird ass reason, it never got old for me. It might be because that camera angle is so awkward, but every single time I just laugh to myself. It doesn't hurt that the music is spot on either. Just take a listen to the music that plays while Hack is hanging out on her spaceship. You feel that? That's the sound of childhood within you. That's the sound of hot chocolate and grilled cheese in your parents' basement. That's the feeling of the controller in your hand for the first time, begging you to go on an adventure! A Hat in Time hit me right in my nostalgia nerve. It time traveled me to a simpler era, one where plumbers, bears, bandicoots, and dragons were the biggest stars in gaming. I want to spend time in its world, which is great because collecting everything could take forever. It's kind of crazy to think about how I feel nostalgic about a new game that has no roots. New nostalgia is real. I'm making it a thing. It's, it's, it, I'm doing it right here, right now. You're watching history. You're watching the History Channel. So with the Hat in Time coming out, I knew I'd love it, at least in concept. The question is, would I love it when I got my hands on it? I purposely avoided all kinds of betas and alphas to make sure that the final experience I got was true to that. I'm happy to report that if you are the kind of guy that has been really enjoying the return to form of platformers with things like Super Mario Odyssey, then a hat in time is for you. The most important thing to me from a platformer perspective are the controls, and Hat Kid controls real well. This game is all about mobility and performing crazy platforming spectacles to get to new areas. It feels like I'm playing a platformer in which the main character comprises of the best elements from other games. Hat Kid can double jump, 
dive, run and jump off walls, and combo all of these things together. And we haven't even discussed the hat. After running around and collecting enough of these yarn balls, you can unlock a new hat. Each and every hat has its own power. Some even have their own movement options that are great for speed running, sequence breaking, and even just creative pathing for yourself as you play through the game. At some point, you get a hat that lets you literally stop time and run. Having all of the hats give you different powers is a super cool way to make you try different things with your play style. On the topic of collectibles, there are little gems that act as your currency for purchasing things like badges for your hat. These badges will either boost your capabilities or reduce them significantly. There's one badge that reduces your hit points to exactly one, making it pretty dang rough if you want that self-inflicted challenge. And the salesman is quite creepy and weird, but make sure you visit him on every stage as he offers you different badges until you've bought them all. There's also these ancient things called relics that literally are just household things you've come to know. A train set, a hamburger, things like that. However, to Hat Kid, they're foreign objects she's never seen before. Really cute when you think about it. So within each of these worlds or levels or whatever you want to call them, there are a set number of timepieces that you need to get in order to progress further into the story. These objectives are somewhat linear, but they're very exciting nonetheless. The first three worlds have all of these awesome plot lines that will make you stay engaged from start to finish, especially in the subcon forest. Dealing with the Snatcher is really a fun time. It's creepy and uncomfortable, but also very humorous. And the Penguins vs. Owls plotline of the Hollywood area just gets more and more entertaining the further you get involved. Yet, when you finally get to the last world, the timepiece missions there go a little bit longer than I'd like. You could easily end up spending 20 to 40 minutes trying to get each of these timepieces. It's unfortunate to say the least, but in my opinion, if I had to give this game a rating, I'd say that 90% of this game is damn near perfect. You'll notice that after you unlock a fair amount of timepieces, you'll discover these time rifts. Time rifts are essentially bonus timepieces that are subjugated to one of two different scenarios that are accessed based on finding the physical location of that time rift. The first one could be a collectathon, where you'll find yourself in these sandbox type rooms. You'll have to find parts of a storybook while collecting these little crowns that unlock the next sandbox entrance. Conquering these sandbox dungeons will reward you with a timepiece and a complete storybook that will show you in detail what happened in the world you are currently involved with. The second type of time rift is something you'll instantly recognize. These are puzzle platforming areas that are somewhat challenging, but if you've played Super Mario Sunshine or Galaxy, you'll know exactly how to progress and what to do next. Upon beating these time rifts, you'll also get the ability to use a slot machine. These slot machines will give you random unlockables such as a skin for a hat, a new color scheme for Hat Kid, or even some music. All of them have rankings based on importance and rarity. Unfortunately, there's not enough time rifts in the game or coins to redeem to unlock everything, so what you see is what you get. Kind of a bummer to me, but apparently the devs did this knowing that there will be a mod community waiting in the wings to run with this. Kind of cool, but I wish I could have mixed and matched the hats and colors accordingly. The boss fights, for the first time in a long while when I can think of a game in boss fights, actually feel like a fight. These bosses all put up a pretty gnarly battle, but if you die, you're gonna start all the way back to the beginning of said fight. And almost every boss in this game has several different phases, so get good my friends. Patience is huge, and remember the beard mantra. Type boys take their time. My favorite thing about a hat in time comes from the character and the journey Hat Kid goes on. Nothing is ever said from our silent heroine, but she's so adorable, it works very nicely. Hat Kid is nimble, quick, and can jump probably over like 100 candlesticks. No big deal. My ultimate gripe with the hat in time, there's not enough content in the game. You can easily complete this bad boy within a day or so, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. There are a lot of games out there that people are constantly playing or waiting to play in the wings. I loved every minute of playing this game. I just wish I had more to enjoy. Good on you, Gears for Breakfast. You made a new platformer that I wish I already had a sequel for. I wish I had played this game sooner. Easily would have placed into my top 10 games of 2017. I just wasn't done with the game yet when I made the video.
Even though a hand time is a short experience, as a completionist, the achievements in the game are not only very doable, but you actually get something for completing the entire game. For collecting every time piece in the game, when you do beat the game, you will be awarded with the completionist's hat. Huh, look at that. I don't know if it's a nod to me or my fellow completionists out there in the world, but if so, we all thank you from the bottom of our hearts. This replaces the hat that Hat Kid wears and doesn't do anything that the default hat doesn't already do. However, it is obvious that the hat has gotten a design change, which is nice. Kudos, gang. You completed the game. Aside from this completion bonus, a hat in time is a beautiful walk in the park. A short walk, but one that will make you happy from start to finish and make you want to walk more and more. I should just take more walks. In my playthrough of a hat in time, there were 10 and a half hours of total playtime, 40 timepieces put back into the ship, 12 human relics, several different skins for hats, music tracks, and color schemes gambled for with the slot machine, and 36 different times that I smooched someone from the mafia. They're all just so cute. A Hat in Time is a love letter for those of you who grew up with 3D platformers. One that I recommend across the board despite its length. I cannot wait for more stuff from Gears for Breakfast. This is the beginning of a bright future for their company and their possible new franchise. Honestly, I would love to see a 2D platformer using Hat Kid. I'd love to see where they take Hat Kid next. A Hat in Time is a bundle of joy that everyone should experience. It's not that expensive of a game, and it has a lot of depth built into what would be a pretty short experience. Honestly, that's the only problem, is that it's kind of a short experience if you're a marathon gamer like myself. But if you're kind of casually playing this game, then this may be a great way to start 2018. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Complete It. That's all time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you're new here and you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button. If you missed last week's video on our top 10 games of 2017, give it a click or tap right here. A big thank you to those folks over here on Patreon for supporting us. And as always, guys, we'll see you next Friday for another brand new episode of The Completionist. Bye.